Welcome back. It's still now breakfast here on Radio Now 95.3 FM Lagos today, Wednesday the 3rd of January, and my name's Nabila Osman. On the interview today, the war in Gaza has been on for nearly three months now and has rapidly developed on many fronts. The United Nations warns that millions of Palestinians are at risk of hunger and disease, while authorities on the ground have counted up to 22,000 people who have been confirmed dead as a result of Israeli attacks and bombardments. About 8,000 more are missing. Israel continues to insist that its attacks are an attempt to wipe out Hamas, the group responsible for the October 7th attacks that claimed 1,200 Israeli lives. In response to Israel's indiscriminate attacks, South Africa has instituted proceedings against the country at the International Criminal Court. Again, these are multiple developments across different fronts. Joining us on the interview this morning is Ireti Bakare Youssef. Ms. Bakare Youssef is a journalist who was recently in the Middle East in Israel and got a closer look up front at these developments. She joins us on the line now. Hello and welcome to the conversation. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. My pleasure. Let's start off with your experience when you were on the ground in Israel. What did you see? Interesting question. So I think before I say that, I need to let your listeners know we were invited by Israel. Okay, so um, the respective Israeli embassies in different African countries um, chose journalists from the respective countries Um, to come, African journalists, to come to Israel on what they called a media tour to see their side of the story. So effectively the Israeli side of the story. So you've got to bear in mind, everything that I saw was what we were shown. Mm. Okay. And it's what we were shown by the Israeli Foreign Affairs Office in Israel. Are you with me? Right. So that is critical. It's critical that your viewers know that and bear that in mind. So what I saw, what I felt, what I deduced, and my conclusion, I think is the best way to sort of talk about this. Um, Mm -hmm. So, of course, we flew into Israel um, I don't know how long we've got for this interview, by the way, but we got into Israel like in the middle of the night, well, early morning, I think it was on the 17th. And and immediately, and we flew into Tel Aviv, immediately you could feel, I don't know how much you know about Israel as a country um, or what your viewers know, but Israel is effectively a military state. And as you know, military states are paranoid states by nature by character. So immediately, whether there is a war or there isn't a war, they are paranoid states by character. It's a state of distrust and mistrust for practically everybody that is not Israeli, um, or should I say that's foreigner. So, so we got there and immediately you could feel that. You could feel it at the airport, even though it was literally, it was very quiet. There was hardly anybody there. It was only our flight that got in. I understood later that it was only Ethiopian Airlines that was flying there, at least from Africa, by extension, Nigeria. Um, so you could feel that. And and in fact, that sense of, of you know paranoia became apparent when a member of our delegation who clearly wasn't, you know, familiar with Israel's paranoia as a state went ahead of us because he was sitting somewhere else. He went ahead of us. And so he got to immigration before us. We couldn't find him. We got to immigration. We couldn't find him. It took our chaperone to go looking for him. And for some reason, he had been detained. He was being questioned. Not, I'm not saying aggressively or anything, but, you know, it was being questioned. Yet he had a letter, like we all did, that showed that we were invited. So that kind of gives you an idea of the sort of um, the vibe and the, you know, the atmosphere of the country. Because mm. the entry point of any country is an indication of the 
the thread in, if you like, the societal space of, of the country. So that's it. And then, so we we were, we were taken to a number of places. Um, the first place we were taken to, so we're told we would be going to Gaza, which I, which was part of the reason that I wanted to go on the trip that accepted the invitation in the first place, especially as I was the only Nigerian. And as we got on the flight, it became apparent that I was the only female Nigerian African journalist on the in the delegation. So when they had said we'd be going to Gaza, that was literally very important to me. So we were taken to a place which was some five, six, seven kilometers from Gaza. It's on the way to Gaza. We were being taken to southern Israel. Again, when one talks about these things, it's important because not a lot of people are familiar with the landscape and the lay of that land. So you hear Israel, you hear Palestine. One, first and foremost, Israel and Palestine are effectively the same land. Are we clear? That again right. needs to be clear. So the land of Palestine is where the state of Israel was created in 1948. Yeah? So mm -hmm. if you think about it, so what I say to people, put your right hand up. If you put your right hand up, and to, the, to your thumb, the side where you have your thumb is Gaza. The side where you have your little finger is the West Bank and Jerusalem, etc. The middle of that is Israel. So you get an idea of the kind of right. landscape that we're talking about. So when we're going to southern Israel, effectively, we are going into Gaza. So anyway, we stop at this place. The first place that we saw was... Um, like a sort of makeshift, um, you know, like a biker's joint where the bikers will stop on the road to get drinks and get food. It was that kind of place. It was like a makeshift cafe, which was specifically created after October 7th, immediately after October 7th, for the IDF. So IDF soldiers, which is IDF being the Israeli Defense Force, um, would stop there to have a drink, have some food, you know, sort of navigate, talk to their friends, fellow people before going into war in Gaza, before going to fight at the war zone, right? Or they would come out of there if they needed a break once they had been in the war zone and then they could go back. So that's what it was. So we got to see and talk to a lot of IDF. But again, it becomes apparent. You talk to them, they're not particularly the most friendly people in the world. Arguably, soldiers are not particularly friendly, um, mm. but they don't want to be on camera. So you get to speak to them off camera. They're quite monosyllabic. But then I spoke to the civilians, a couple of the civilians, one of whom was... The, one of the founders or the people who had set up that initiative. And everybody that I spoke to, I kept asking them, what does this mean for you? Why was it important for you to set this up? Why was it? Why is it important for you to do what you're doing in this war? And the, each one of them repeatedly said, because we are Israelis, because for us, it's important for Israel to be defended because we were attacked on the 7th of October. So I don't know whether you want me to go on or you have any questions. If you like, I, yeah, can, go, like, I can go on. Let me interrupt you for a moment. Uh, I mean, it's interesting that these are the responses they gave you because when you hear the Palestinian side of the conversation, it's always that this is a war that began, this is an oppression for them that began before October 7th. They talk about 75 years on. Do you get a, Did you get a sense that the Israelis were thinking uh, beyond further back from October 7th, or for them, this particular issue is just about that but that specific attack? Excellent question. Thank you. The contextualization, and I must say, I will continue and forever to repeat, October 7th, 
the attack, yes, the horrid attack of Hamas on Israel on October 7 is contextual. Contextual mean it's what happened on the 6th, on the 5th, on the 1st, in, in, in the months before, the years before. What happened in 67? What happened in 75? What happened in 78? And the millions, and I say millions of Palestinians who have been killed extrajudicially by a colonizing settlement, settling occupier, which is Israel. Since Israel, what the state of Israel was created in 1948, which immediately led to war, which as a result of which Israel expelled violently over 750,000 indigenous Palestinians from their land, the majority of whom were farmers, olive farmers, and etc. fruit farmers. That's what they were. These were people. And including that is the fact that out of those Palestinians, not just Palestinian Muslims, because there are those who are still locked in that uneducative space where they think this is a religious war. It is mm. not. When I say Palestinians, I mean Palestinian Jews, sorry, Palestinian um, Christians and Palestinian Muslims. In actual fact, there were Palestinian Jews in, and they are called Jewish Arabs, in the land of Palestine, not the country of Palestine. You must always be careful. The right. land of Palestine is not the same as the country of Palestine. So think about it. We had the land, the Yoruba land. You know, we had the land of the north before we had the country Nigeria. Do you understand? So hmm. the land of Palestine came, existed before the state of Israel. The land of Palestine existed before the state of Israel, okay? The land of Palestine was a multicultural, multi-religious land. It had Muslims, Christians, and Jews. That is the religion, mm. because it's everything about this, what I will call, as a journalist and as an activist, a genocidal war. Everything about his genocidal, colonizing, ethnic cleansing war is contextual. It is contextual to the history and the existence of a land that had a people who were Palestinians, who were multicultural, multireligious, who got on very well under the Ottoman rule. Prior so let me in interrupt you for a moment. Declaration of Palestine, the partition of the land of Palestine, which led to the creation of the state of Israel in 1948. Go ahead. I mean, I'm glad that you gave us this history because, again, it is important to the conversation. And yet I can't help but ask that. I mean, this is a history that from all indications, when you listen to the Israeli government internationally, they don't typically acknowledge it. And if at all it comes up, they point back to biblical times and continue to insist that that is Jewish heritage. And the fact that the government invited yourself and other journalists to their land to see what was going on and see their side of the story means that they're trying to take, whether it's control of the narrative, that obviously trying to put out a certain image. But your response seems to be counter to whatever it is that they were trying to do. Are you saying that in what they showed you, there was no uh, convincing, if you like? It's a good question again. They showed us many things, right? One of the things that I will point out, so your, to answer your question first is the intention was to change our perception, right? Mm. The question then becomes, Iriti, did that trip change your perception? 
Well, my response will always be, my knowledge of Israel was not based on perception. It was based on education. Do you understand my point? So yeah. perception can be perception can be uninformed, uneducated. But however, that's not true. My what I what I thought and felt and spoke about Israel prior to going to the country was not based on a false perception or a perception of social media. It was based on education and information and knowledge. Therefore, what that trip, what that visit, that media tour, which some called rightfully propagandist tour, what it did for me as an informed, educated person, as a journalist, our job is to always probe and question everything that's in form of us, in front of us, was to not only solidify all that I knew before, but it gave, it gave an even bigger context to it. So like I said, the paranoia, okay, the lack of context from the mm. narrative of the average Israeli, the fact that since October 7th, even moderate Israelis now have become closer to right-wing Israelis, not surprisingly. The fact that, yes, we can accept that Hamas actually, but, but, um, uh, you know, what Hamas did on the 7th was the perpetration of something most abhorrent. But we can also accept that with occupation comes resistance. It is a natural human response. Mm. As I say to people, when the great Nelson Mandela in the 60s, when he got to a point where after years and years of constantly going to the apartheid government and protesting peacefully without any form of arms, sticks or weapons, when it got to a point, even he said, look, nobody's listening to peace anymore. We keep doing it the peaceful way. Nobody's listening to us. So what did the ANC do? They created MK, which is the militia group of their resistance group. And of course, people began to listen. So that's not to give just, that's not to justify violence. That is to give context to the actions right. that happened on the 7th and the 1,000, no longer 1,400, the 1,150 plus, yes, that's the new Israeli number, mm. 1,450 plus people, humans who were killed by that mass attack, most of whom were civilians, a large majority of whom were moderates, because the moderates, incidentally, are the ones who live in the kibbutz, and the kibbutz are the ones in the backyard, literally. When I say backyard, I mean the backyard. Think, think of the large compound in Nigeria, and think of, you know, an outhouse that's down in the same compound. Yes, three kilometers. The kibbutz are in the backyard of Gaza, which is why Hamas broke through from Gaza through the kibbutz into these communities. And the kibbutz are like, think of, think of something like VGC, okay, with just a barbed wire fence that's separating them from, if you like, the well, not if you like, what is effectively the world's largest open air prison. Right. Are you now, with me? Ms. Bakari Yusuf, my apologies. I do have to interrupt you. I feel we're running out of time. Um, yeah. And what I'd like to ask as a final question, because you said they promised to take you into Gaza. If you could give us a summary of what you saw when you went there. And it's clear. I mean, you have a message already from this trip of yours. And maybe you can bring us to an end with the very crux of what you want Nigerians to know just based on that visit. We saw many things. We saw, like I said, 
another one that I didn't get to send, I must touch on very quickly and very briefly, even though it's a wider age, but we're taken to an IDF secure location. One of the IDF offices, they took us into an office, um, into a room rather. We weren't allowed to take any electronic gadgets, not even an electronic watch with us, to watch a 45 minute video, which is made up of clips of the worst atrocities gathered by the IDF on the 7th, okay, of October. We saw that. We'll have to talk about that another time. Um, the message that I do want Nigerians to get to, to go away with, though, is that, number one, this is not a religious war. Stop, if you keep thinking of this in a religious context. It is not. Number two, this is about ethnic cleansing. This is about land. It's about land grabbing. It's about the deletion of a people. Okay? It's about the licensed genocidal action of a colonizer by one of the world's, well, if not the world's policemen who have now turned out to be a hypocrite called the United States, okay? This is about impunity. Israel has impunity to kill Gazans and Palestinians in the West Bank because America said it has a right to defend itself. Well, Israel has a right to defend itself against Hamas, but the Palestinian people are not, and I repeat, not synonymous with Hamas. Mm. That's like saying Every single person who voted for every political party in Nigeria is synonymous with the actions or inactions of that political party. That would just literally be pedestrian mindset. So that's what I want Nigerians to go away with. Palestinians are being killed. They are being deleted. There's a human genocide going on. There is a cultural genocide going on. There's a systematic unthreading, unraveling, and debilitation of the strong Palestinian society going on actively as we speak. Over 22,000 Palestinian killed so far and rising. Fundamentally, this war is about humanity. In fact, it is not a war. It is a deletion. So this deletion questions and probes the humanity of every single one of us. And what I want Nigerians to go away with is, in journalism, we talk about objectivity. We talk about fair and balance. But just like the South African apartheid, no journalist, worth their salt and no human, worth their humanity, could be on the side of apartheid. And this is exactly the same thing. So this mm. is a time when the only thing that matters is truth and the only balance is truth. Because right. to claim an effort to be objective is actually in favor of the oppressor, which is something I certainly will never be. And I don't think radio now is about, neither do I think Nigeria or Nigerians should ever want to be. Not the same Nigerians that gave up their money to actually quash, squash apartheid in South Africa. We will never be against humanity. We will always be on the side of the right. And right now, the only side that matters is the side of the oppressed. That's the message I leave. Ms. Bakari Yusuf, I want to say a big thank you for your time, but also for sharing with us your experience and your very strong convictions on this conversation. And as you said, it's quite critical that there is coverage on this matter, especially for the Palestinian people um, who continue to lose their voice on the international uh, scene over this. Uh, perhaps we will have a further conversation after the outcome of the ICC case. Uh, as you know, again, South Africa has taken Israel to the International Criminal Court on this matter, and we are following closely on this. But thank you again for joining us and according us your time. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Have a good show.
Our guest, Ireti Bakari Yusuf, is a journalist who's been covering the war in Gaza quite closely. She returned from a trip to Israel. Uh, this was uh, on the invitation of the Israeli government. Her words, her experience, what she saw on the ground here on the interview. And that's our time this morning. Stick around in just a bit. Now breakfast continues.